Turn back to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. We uh, kind of left off midway last week, and that's the, the nature of time restraints which we have in churches and um, also the nature of the scripture. We just couldn't get through it all, and that's going to happen. It's going to happen over and over again. So I want to encourage you as you turn to 1 John chapter 2 that you uh, be faithful to be here. This isn't a lot of different messages that John's given us. It's one message from 1 John, and all these things tie together, and it's important for us to be together and to walk through this together and to keep up together and to learn together as we walk through 1 John. 1 John chapter 2 Verses 1 through 6, we started looking at this last week, and if you are not here, I want to encourage you to uh, listen to that message, get your hands on it somehow, and listen to that message so that you can catch up. I'll give you a quick review as we walk through the text together. 1 John chapter 2, the first thing we saw last week was John's purpose for writing this portion of his letter. He said, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that... So that, here comes his purpose, you may not sin. So John's purpose here in writing this is to help us avoid every sin. In the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 48, we must be perfect even as our Father in heaven is perfect. That's the purpose here. We are striving for perfection. Then we saw the possibility that this is a possibility because John is writing these things to help us attain his purpose. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that I'm giving you these things, so that I'm giving you these truths, so that you may fulfill the purpose and not sin. I'm writing these things to you in order to make it possible for you to avoid every sin that is besetting you. And Paul echoes this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, when he tells us that no temptation has overtaken us except that which is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but will, with every temptation, give us a way of escape. So we see the purpose, and we see the possibility, and then we saw the pleader. If we read on in 1 John 2 and verse 1, he says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have an advocate. And we define advocate as one who pleads the cause of another in a court of law. He is there with us, encouraging us. He is there with us, lifting us up. He is there with us, assuring us of complete victory. And he is there in heaven interceding for us. And he is there in heaven pleading our cause. We have a pleader. And then we pick up this morning in verse 2. So that's where we spent last week, the purpose, the possibility, and our pleader. And John continues that thought in verse 2. And we see, fourthly, the propitiation. That's a big word, isn't it? That's, that's a very churchy word. No, it's not. It's a biblical word, right? I, I don't like when people take biblical words and say they're too churchy. Let's come up with a new one. This is what the Holy Spirit gave us. He said, God has provided us an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is our propitiation. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, but not just ours, also for the whole world. So what does this big word, propitiation, mean? This big biblical word, propitiation. Well, uh, the English definition is this. The act of appeasing the wrath and obtaining the favor of an offended person. So think about that. Here's what, a, what propitiation means. Propitiation means I cool you down when you're angry and I take away the offense. So it's appeasing wrath. It is appeasing wrath and obtaining favor. It's cooling someone down. Calm down. Don't be angry anymore. Now, show me favor. Okay? Now, that's the English definition. It's a pretty good definition. But if we want a really good definition, where do we find the best definition for biblical words? In the Bible, right? So I want to just share with you a few scriptures. 
We'll get through what we can get through. If we have to stop again, we'll make it a three-part series. But I want you to see this because this is good news. Okay, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 25. This word, propitiation, is used, and this is going to help us understand it. Okay, should be on the screen. If not, you can turn there. Uh, Romans 3, 21 to 25. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, here's, here's what he's saying thus far. The righteousness of God, how we can be made righteous before God, has been revealed. It's been manifested, and it is apart from the law. You cannot be good enough. You cannot keep the law sufficiently enough to be made righteous. There is a way to be made righteous that has been revealed apart from the law of God. And this way of righteousness has been witnessed by the law and by the prophets. This is not something new. And we're going to see that as we move on through 1 John. This is not something new. This is something that the law testifies to. There's a way to be made righteous. And it's not by keeping the law. This is something that the prophets give witness to. There's a way to be righteous. And it's not by being good enough. He goes on, even the righteousness of God. Here it is. Here's how you're righteous. Through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there's no distinction, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, every one of us has failed to keep the law. Every one of us has fallen short of the standard. It doesn't matter if you're red, yellow, black, or white, or some shade in between. It doesn't matter if you're Jew. It doesn't matter if you're Greek. It doesn't matter if you're Baptist. It doesn't matter who or where you're from. You have fallen short of the standard of God. But thanks be to God, there is a way to be made righteous apart from the law. The law testifies to this. The prophets testify to this. And it is by faith in Jesus Christ alone to everyone who believes. Because we're all on level ground. We're all on level ground. We have all fallen short. Now, he goes on in verse 24. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Whom God displayed publicly as a what? Propitiation in his blood through faith. So there's a way to be made righteous apart from the law that the law testifies to, that the prophets testify to, and it is by faith in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and the fact that Jesus Christ has been put on display and shed his blood for us in order to appease the wrath of God and bring us favor with God, to justify us, to make us right with God. Does that make sense? Hebrews 1.17. Therefore, he, this is speaking of Jesus, had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So what did the high priest do? The high priest would go into the holy place and the high priest would sacrifice an animal and shed the blood of that animal in the presence of God in order to appease the wrath of God for a set amount of time. Well, now Jesus has become man and he has sympathized with us in our weaknesses so that he can be our high priest and he can enter into the holy of holies and he can make an ultimate sacrifice to forever eternally appease the wrath of God towards us. The veil was torn and now we are free. He's our propitiation. He became like us to pay for our sin. This is the gospel. Now, unless you think I'm trying to make God an angry God that God's not, he doesn't, he's not really that kind of God, you know, who's a wrathful God. That's all Old Testament stuff. Listen to the New Testament, Romans 5, 8 through 11. But God showed his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We know that verse, don't we? We like that verse, don't we? We're thankful for that verse, but Paul started at the end. He says, God shows his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him. By who? By Jesus from what? Don't you think for a moment you're being saved from hell, buddy? You're not being saved from hell. You are being saved from the just wrath of a just and holy and righteous God. And get this. Jesus... 
God in the flesh saved us from himself. God's the one we should be fearful of. God is the one we should be fearful of. He is the one who has the power to cast us into hell or to let us into heaven. The devil doesn't have the power to cast anybody into hell. The devil gets cast into hell. God's just wrath is poured out on sinners who have not been born again and who have not been justified by the blood of Christ. And his wrath is justly carried out. And that's what sends people to hell. And here the Bible tells us that Jesus took on flesh. He became the God-man in order to save us from the wrath of God. And that's what Jesus dreaded when he went to the cross. It wasn't the, it wasn't the nails. It wasn't the whipping. It wasn't the crucifixion, as brutal as that was. Some 30,000 men had been crucified by the Romans in the lifetime of Jesus alone. Many men had walked down that road to the cross. Jesus isn't sweating drops of blood because he's afraid of what 30,000 plus other men have experienced in his lifetime. Jesus is sweating drops of blood because he wants the cup of God's wrath to pass from him, but not my will, may your will be done. He goes to the cross, the sky turns black because the Father is pouring out his wrath upon his Son. Why? Because he's our propitiation. He, the Son, is appeasing the wrath of the Father and is bringing us into favor with Him. Do you see the measure of this sacrifice? It says, if if while we were enemies, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And that makes Romans 5.1 make more sense, doesn't it? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's what a propitiation does. He brings peace with God. He brings peace with the one who is offended. And we have offended a just and holy God. And now John is saying, this, the purpose of me writing this is so that you can live a sinless, spotless life. And it is possible as we walk in the light. But when we stumble and when we fall, there's no need in balling up in the fetal position and throwing in the towel because we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ who's encouraging us and pleading our cause. And we know that He has appeased the wrath of the Father. And He's brought us into favor with Him. Him because he is our propitiation. Does that make sense? Well, this is not something we can keep to ourselves, is it? Because he says this is, he's the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Listen, this is not something we keep to ourselves. This is something that as we grasp The glory of the gospel pushes us out. It pushes us out to our neighbors. It pushes us out to our classmates. It pushes us out to our co-workers. It pushes us out to the orphans. It pushes us out to the widows. It pushes us out to the poor and the needy. It pushes us out to the very ends of the earth earth and the unreached and the unengaged people in this world. This is something that pushes us out because it's not just for us. It's not just for us. It's not just about us. Our propitiation. Lastly, in verses 3 through 6, the proof. So we see the purpose, the possibility, the pleader, the propitiation, and now the proof. How do we know that he is our advocate? How do we know that he is our propitiation? Well, John tells us in verses 3 through 6, by this we know. That we have come to know him. By this we know that we have come to know him, our advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. By this we know that we have come to know him, our propitiation. If, that's a big two letter word, isn't it? If we keep his commandments. Now that doesn't take a seminary degree to interpret, does it? Most of the Bible doesn't, by the way. The Bible was written to normal people, not professors. So what is this saying? This is how we know that he is our advocate. This is how we know he is our propitiation. This is how we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says 
I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a what? Liar. So if I go out of this place and say, oh, I know Jesus, I'm a Christian, I'm good, and yet I don't, I'm not characterized by keeping his commandments, what does the Bible say that I am? I'm not saying that we're liars. The Bible's saying that we're liars if we do that. And the truth is not in him. Verse 5, whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. If you just turn over one page to 1 John 3, look in verses 6 through 9. We'll get to this, but I'm going to fast forward. 1 John 3, beginning in verse 6, listen to what he says again. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or, known him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seeds abide, seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. We see right there John echoing. If you live a life that is characterized by sin, that should raise a big red flag for where you stand with Jesus. If you live a life where your words are characterized by sin, where your looks are characterized by sin, where what you listen to is characterized by sin, with what you feel is characterized by sin, with what you do is characterized by sin, if you live that way, that should raise a red flag because our walk, our obedience, our righteousness gives evidence and proof of who we really are. Unless you think I'm making this up. Revelation 21, 7 through 8. We're going to run through some scriptures really fast and just look at what they say. Revelation 21, 7 through 8 says this, The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. In other words, people who are characterized in this way do not go to heaven. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. It will be on the screen as well. Take a deep breath. Let's look at what it says. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Is that pretty clear? That people who are characterized by unrighteousness aren't going to heaven. Because when we truly are justified, it changes our lives, right? Listen to the words of Jesus in John 3, 36. He who believes... And I want you to pay close attention to this, okay? He who believes in the Son has what? Eternal life. But he who does not what? Obey the Son will not see life, but the what of God? Wrath of God abides on him. In other words, that person has no propitiation. The person who does not obey the Son has no propitiation. The wrath of God is still on them. This is very clear. We could flip those words around, it is so clear, and say, He who obeys the Son must have eternal life, and the one who does not believe in the Son has the wrath of God on him. Belief and obedience are almost interchangeable in the New Testament. Belief and obedience are almost interchangeable in the Christian life because belief, true, saving belief, always, always results in obedience. True, saving belief is always going to bring about obedience. What I'm trying to get you to see and understand, because I grew up, I grew up, Bible, belt, buckle of the Bible, belt, Southern Baptist, okay? What I'm trying to get you to see is our profession of faith 
where we walk down an aisle, repeat a prayer, pray our own prayer, get baptized, join the church, whatever that is that we do, that has value. We're going to see that in 1 John. He talks about professing Christ. That's important. Jesus himself said that we should confess him as our Lord. That we should call on the name of the Lord to be saved, right? But what I'm trying to get you to see is everything does not hinge on what we say. Because anybody can say anything. We can line up every six-year-old in vacation Bible school and say, Do you want to go to hell and burn forever? Or do you want to go to heaven? How many of you want to go to heaven? Oh, I want to go to heaven. Okay, well, repeat this after me. Jesus, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I'm a sinner. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. Save me, Jesus. Save me, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, if you pray that, you're a Christian now, and you're okay. And then all the little six-year-olds run back out and steal from each other, fight on the playground, talk back to mama and daddy, and have, have we, is that really how it works? Because if so, we can do like the Catholics and just start sprinkling them at birth and saying, okay, they all are sprinkled and they're good. That's kind of what we do when we line them up. We just sprinkle them. What I'm wanting you to see is salvation is more than what we say. Salvation impacts every facet of our life. I think we have time. Matthew chapter 21. Turn there with me. Matthew chapter 21. And if I go a little long, I'll give you a bonus next week, and I'll cut it a little short. Okay, is that a deal? And I'm lying, so I ask your forgiveness. <laughs> Matthew 21, Matthew chapter 21, verse 28. <clears throat> There's a story Jesus tells that really shook me, and this was years and years ago, and maybe it'll shake you into seeing this. Matthew 21, 28, Jesus is speaking to the religious crowd, okay? And he says, but what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it, and he went. The man came to the second and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the Father? And they say, which one? The first. The first. So here, we're sitting in our Southern Baptist Church. We have a fiery revival preacher come in. And he preaches the gospel message. And we've got a little stirring going on here. And there's somebody sitting back there. And he's going, I'm just not going forward. I'm just not going down there to talk to the preacher. I'm just not doing it. And they walk out the doors. And they drive home. And they sit in their recliner. And God continues to work on them. And they regret their sin. They repent of their sin. They believe that gospel message they heard. And they obey Christ. The other person who's sitting in the service gets a little stirred up and they run down the aisle, they pray the prayer, they check off the card, they go through the baptistry, and they live their own life, their own way from that day forward. Which of the two did the will of the Father? Was it the first guy or the last guy? The first guy. Our repentance and faith and our crying out to God is vitally important. But there is more to the Christian life than making a decision for Jesus. There is more to the Christian life than making a decision. It is about following Jesus. Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who, what? Does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now I want you to just stop, time out, wake up if you're asleep, and catch up here with me, because I want you to hear this very loud and clear, because we can start getting messed up, and we can start getting mixed up, and we can start stepping out of bounds a little bit here. We've got to get this quote down. We are saved by faith alone. We are justified by faith. We are saved by faith alone. But a faith that really saves 
is never alone. Do you get that? We're saved by faith alone, but a faith that really saves is never, ever, ever alone. It is always followed by good works, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. You're not saved by good works. But when you are saved, you are recreated for what? Good works. We're saved by grace for good works. Now, some of you may be feeling some tension here because you're going, wow, man, I had a bad week. I had a bad morning just getting here at the 830 service. Okay, I've got some kids, and I had a bad morning, and boy, I might be lost. And then you get up tomorrow morning, and it's just like heaven came down and glory filled your soul, and you have your quiet time, and you're able to pray, and you get out, and you don't really say anything ugly to your wife before you leave, and, and everything's marvelous. And, okay, I'm good today. And what we can start inadvertently doing is saying, well, I did good today, so I must be saved, and I did bad today, so I must be lost. We cannot fall into that trap because that is being saved and assured by our works. We don't need to be asking ourselves how we did today because, listen... On the best day of the best week, of the best month, of the best year of your life, you are not good enough to go to heaven. You need Jesus. And on the worst day of the worst week, of the worst month, of the worst year of your life, you're not too bad for Jesus to save. So we just need to step away from that and maybe ask ourselves something. Maybe this will help. What trajectory am I on? You know what a trajectory is? When that ship takes off, and it goes out into the deep, deep, wide ocean. And its course is supposed to be set at one degree. If you have that ship set at 1.2 degrees, are you going to hit your destination if it's 5,000 miles away? If your ship is supposed to be set at 1 degree and you have it set at 1.2, I mean, that's pretty doggone close, isn't it? By the time you travel three or 4,000 miles, are you going to land at your harbor, yes or no? Why? Because your trajectory is off. Maybe we need to ask ourselves, what trajectory am I on? Am I moving away from holiness this morning? Am I on a trajectory that's taking me off course and is taking me away from holiness and towards worldliness? If so, that may not even mean you're not a Christian. What that might mean is God is convicting you through this message to correct your trajectory. And you need to repent and turn back to Jesus. Does that make sense? But if your trajectory is true, and you're, and you're pressing towards, from worldliness, towards holiness. And you're pressing away from worldliness, towards Christ's likeness. That should give us not just assurance, but joyful assurance, right? As a believer, if you can be happy and joyful when your trajectory is off, that is giving evidence there is a major problem. At best, you need to repent and come back to Jesus. At worst, you need to see the fact that you are not truly born again. And if our trajectory is true, and we're moving towards holiness, that gives us joyful assurance. A Christian can't be joyful when their trajectory is off. A true Christian will not have, they may have assurance, but they won't have joyful assurance if they're not walking the walk as well as talking the talk. Does that make sense? So John is giving us this whole letter so that we can have joyful assurance. And he's saying part of joyful assurance is striving not to just be at a 1.2 trajectory, but to be true, perfect, pursuing holiness, clinging to our advocate, trusting in our propitiation, and proving that we know him and that he knows us by how we live our lives. What is your life this morning? What is your lifestyle this morning saying about you? What is it saying about your standing with God? What trajectory are you on this morning? Are you, are you sailing true towards holiness, towards Christ-likeness, towards purity, towards perfection? Are we moving in that direction? Then you can have joyful assurance in the fact that it's not you 
but it's Christ working in you. How's your trajectory? Are you moving away from where you should be and drifting into worldliness? Are you drifting? Are you drifting more and more like the culture? Are you drifting away more and more like those around you? Are you drifting slowly? Oh, it's just a little little drift, preacher. You know, just point two, drift. You're going to miss your destination. Don't drift. Repent and come back to Jesus at best or recognize the fact that you are content to drift and recognize the fact that you need Christ this morning. The good news is, is he's the propitiation not just for those who are on the right trajectory. He's, he's the propitiation for those who are on the worst trajectory ever this morning. You may have come in this place, you're like, I've been playing a game for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Yeah, I walked down an aisle. Yeah, I prayed a prayer. You know what? Yeah, I joined the church. Yeah, I've taught Sunday school. Yeah, I've become a deacon. Yeah, I've put money in the plate. Yeah, I've done all these wonderful things. But man, I know deep down in my heart, I don't love God. I don't desire to know Him more. I don't, I don't have a passion for Christ. And deep down in my heart, my trajectory is way off. Guess what? He's the propitiation. Not just for those who know him, but for those who don't yet know him. And you can turn away from your sin and your self-righteousness this morning. And you can put your faith and your trust in Christ. And he can justify you. He can appease the wrath of God. He can bring upon you the favor of God. And he can put you on a true trajectory today if you'll humble yourself and come to him. Would you do that this morning as we... Turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy, your grace. We thank you that you are our propitiation. The propitiation for our sin. And for those who don't yet know you. Would you speak to us this morning? Would you reveal to us your will for us this morning? Would you whisper with your still small voice in our spiritual ear this morning and bring us to respond to you? as you would have us to respond, God. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand? We'll sing. God's spoken to you. You need to make a decision. You can do that this morning.